So welcome to Unit 10 Personality, Module 59, Exploring the Self. These, um, this recording aligns with Meyer Psychology for the AP Course 3rd Edition. So the learning target, explain why psychology has generated so much research on the self and discuss the importance of self-esteem to our well-being. Describe how excessive optimism, blindness to one's own incompetence, and self-serving bias reveal the cost of self-esteem and explain how defensive and insecure self-esteem differ. And then finally discuss how individualist and collectivist cultures differ in their values and goals. So why has psychology generated so much research on the self? Well, psychology's concern with our self, sense of self dates back to at least the famous William James who devoted more than 100 pages of his 1890 Principles of Psychology, one of the most famous books ever in psychology to the topic. By 1943, Gordon Alport, another famous name in psychology, lamented that the self had become lost to view. Although humanistic psychology's later emphasis on the self did not instigate much scientific research, it did help renew the concept of self and keep it alive. Where are we today in our studying of the self? So now more than a century after William James, the self is one of Western psychology's most vigorously researched topics. Every year, new studies appear on self-esteem, self-disclosure, self-awareness, self-schema, self-monitoring, and much more self-related research. So where is the self located in the brain? Neuroscientists have searched for the self by identifying a central frontal lobe region that activates when people respond to self-reflective questions about their traits and dispositions. So how do we define the self? In contemporary psychology, the self is assumed to be the center of personality, the organizer of our thoughts, feelings, and actions. The self answers the question, who am I? A question many of us may ask. So what are our possible selves? Possible selves include your visions of the self you dream of, becoming, becoming the rich self, the successful self, the self you fear becoming, the lonely self, the failed self. Play, pretend play actually um, within children, maybe adults and older kids, I'm not sure. Mostly within children, let's children imagine possible selves. The spotlight effect is the tendency of overestimating Others noticing and evaluating of our appearance, performance, and blunders, as if we presume a spotlight shines on us. You know, we, we actually usually overestimate how much other people are paying attention to what we're doing. Our self-focused perspective may motivate us, but it can also lead us to presume too readily that others are noticing and even evaluating us. So what about research on the spotlight effect? One study had Cornell University t-shirts where t-shirts featuring soft soft rock singer Barry Manilow before entering a room with other students. The t-shirt wearers, wearers guessed that nearly half their peers would take notice of the shirt, but in reality only 23% of the students noticed the shirt. The point to remember, we stand out less than we imagine. Even with dorky clothes and bad hair, not as many people are paying attention to us as we think they are. So self-esteem and self-efficacy, what are they? Self-esteem is one's feelings of high or low self-worth. It's how we feel about ourselves. If we think, if we like ourselves, if we think we're kind of cool, if we don't think like ourselves and we think we don't really matter, that's different than self-efficacy. One sense of competence, competence and effectiveness. Self-efficacy is our belief about our ability to actually do something. So do we believe we can pass that hard math test? Do we think we can build a cabinet? Do we think we are able to take care of someone else? That is self-efficacy. So benefits of high self-esteem, we hear about self-esteem a lot. What are the benefits of having a high self-esteem? People who feel good about themselves have fewer sleepless nights, they succumb less easily to pressures to conform, and they're more persistent at difficult tasks. But how about the effects of low self-esteem? Those who are negative about themselves have tended to be oversensitive and judgmental. So, but what are the drawbacks of having excessive optimism? It can blind us to real risks. More than 1,000 studies have shown how our natural positive thinking bias can promote sort of an unrealistic optimism about future events. So what does it mean to be blind to one's own incompetence? This is really interesting and some of you may actually have heard of this effect. People are often are most overconfident when they are most incompetent. This is one of those things that's really important to remember. Um, people, are off, people often are most overconfident when they are most incompetent. That said, Justin Kruger and David Dunning um, 
that, sorry, that said Kruger and Dunning is because it often takes competence to recognize competence, right? So if we're incompetent, we can't recognize our incompetence. We have to be competent to be able to recognize it. The, this ignorance of one owns incompetence is now called the Dunning-Kruger effect. It can produce overconfidence when we are actually incompetent. How about the self-serving bias? It's a readiness to perceive oneself favorably. Personality psychologists have found that most people choose the second positive door, which leads to positive self-thoughts, okay? We have a good reputation within ourselves. People act more responsibly for good deeds than for bad and for successes versus failures. Athletes often privately credit their victories to their own prowess and their losses to bad breaks, lousy officiating, or the other team's exceptional performance. How many times when a team loses, your team or that you're playing on that you really like and you blame the officials, right? Most students who receive poor test grades criticize the test or the teacher. They don't criticize their internal characteristics. Drivers filling out insurance forms have explained their accidents in words such as a pedestrian hit me and went under my car. So most people see themselves also as better than average, the Lake Wobegon effect. In several studies, 90% of business managers and more than 90% of professors rated their performance as superior to that of the average peer, which is, of course, statistically impossible. In Australia, 86% of people rate their job performance as above average and only 1% as below average. In the U.S., 49% of men said they provide more, half or more of the child care and only 31% of their wives agreed, agreed with that. So narcissism. Speaking of our high value of ourselves uh, sometimes, um, narcissism is excessive love and self-absorption. People with a narcissistic personality tend to be materialistic, desire fame, have inflated expectations, um, gamble, cheat, get into inappropriate relationships more often without commitment, and all of these things which have been increasing as narcissism has been increasing within our society as well. So what are some negative effects of narcissism? Narcissistic people, which are more often men, forgive others less, take a game playing approach to their romantic relationships, and are more likely to engage in sexually forceful behavior. Narcissists crave adulation, are active on social media, and often become enraged when criticized. They're conceited, self-important individuals turn nasty towards those who puncture their bubbles of self-love. So narcissists do not like being criticized. So what is the difference between secure self-esteem and defensive self-esteem? Secure self-esteem is a sense of self is less contingent on ex those external evaluations. It's to feel accepted for who we are and not for our looks, wealth, or acclaim. It relieves pressure to succeed and it enables us to focus sort of beyond ourselves. Whereas defensive self-esteem within that, the focus is on sustaining itself, which makes failure and criticism, criticism feel really, really threatening. Defensive people may respond to perceived threats with anger or aggression. So what's the difference between the terms individualism and collectivism? We talked about them um, throughout this, this class, but um, we'll review them here a little bit. Individualism, giving priority to one's own goals over group goals and defining one's individual, one's identity in terms of personal attributes rather than group identifications. Whereas collectivism is giving priority to the goals of one's group and defining one's identity accordingly. So what characterizes an individualist culture? Individualists have an independent sense of me and an awareness of their unique personality, personal convictions and values. They prioritize personal goals, they define their identity mostly in terms of personal traits, and they strive for personal control and individual achievement. So how are Americans Individualistic, you know, usually more typically, but not always, most Western cultures are a little bit more individualistic. So how is this reflected in baby names? In recent years, the percentage of American babies receiving one of that year's 10 most common names has plunged. There's more focus on individualism. What characterizes a collectivist culture? Well, group identifications provide a basic sense of belonging, a set of values, and an assurance of security. Collectivists tend to have deeper attachments to their groups, their family, their clan, company, and elders receive respect usually within collectivist cultures. So in, in terms of responding to a disaster, a collectivist culture um, like Japan, um, including duty to others and social harmony were on display after the devastating 2011 11 earthquake and tsunami. 
virtually there was no looting and residents remained orderly. Um, and you can see there as they're waiting for line, in line for drinking water that there was a, there's different values. There was no looting and trying to get something more than someone else within this collectivist culture. So here's a, um, a visual, I'm not gonna read through it, I'll leave it on here for you know, like 30 seconds so you can while I take a sip of water, of the differences, the contrast between individualism and collectivism. Okay, now to the reviews. The self is the center of personality, organizing our thoughts, feelings, and actions. Considering possible selves helps motivate, motivate us toward positive development, but we don't wanna to focus too intensely. It can lead to that spotlight effect, thinking that people are um, you know, paying too much more attention to us than they actually are. High self-esteem is beneficial, but unrealistically high self-esteem is dangerous, and it's linked actually to aggressive behavior. Self-efficacy is our sense of competence and it's different than self-esteem. Rather than unrealistically promoting children's feelings of self-worth, it's better to reward their achievements, which leads to feelings of competence. Excessive optimism can lead to complacency and prevent us from seeing real, real risks, while blindness to one's own incompetence may lead us to make the same mistakes repeatedly. I think Dunning-Kruger. Self-serving bias is our normal tendency to perceive ourselves favorably as when viewing ourselves as better than average, which a lot of us tend to do in a lot of different domains, or when accepting credit for our successes, but not blaming ourselves for our failures. Narcissism is excessive self-love and self-absorption. Um, the difference between defensive self-esteem is fragile, focuses on sustaining itself and views failure or criticism as a threat. Secure self-esteem is sturdy, enabling us to feel accepted for who we are. So the differences between individualist and collectivist cultures and their values and goals. Although within cultures, individuals vary, of course, different cultures tend to emphasize either individualism or collectivism. Cultures based on self-reliant individualism tend to value personal independence and achievement. They define identity in terms of self-esteem, personal goals and attributes, and personal rights and liberties. Cultures based on socially connected collectivism differ. They tend to value group goals, social identity and commitments, and they define identity in terms of interdependence, tradition, and harmony. That is the end of the module. Thank you so much for listening. Take care.